Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a student and a doctor at a student health centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning. Morning. Come in, sit down. Now, you're a new patient, aren't you? Yes, that's right. OK, so I'd better get some basic details down first. Right, we'll start with your name. Martin Hansen. Do you spell that S-O-N or S-E-N? H-A-N-S-E-N. -E OK, and you are a first-year student. Yes, I am. Studying... Medicine, actually. Ha! <laughs> Good choice. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. And your address? Yes, it's 13 Chatham Street. That's C-H-A-T-H-A-M, isn't it? That's right. And your phone number? 01734 24655. 01734 24655. No, you got the 6 and the 4 the wrong way round. It's 24655. Ha! <laughs> Sorry, right. And when were you born? On the 15th of June, 1986. Here in New Zealand? Yes. Now, let's get some of your medical background. Have you ever had any serious illness or accident? A broken leg I got playing football when I was 17. I was in the school team. What position did you play in? I was the goalkeeper. A lot of standing around then. Yes, when we were winning. Right. Anything else? No, apart from that, nothing. And have you had any operations of any kind? No. The only time I've been to hospital was when I broke my leg. Fine. Any allergies? Yes, to dust and cats. Ooh, what form does that take? How do you react? Uh, they both make me sneeze a bit, nothing else. So you're not allergic to antibiotics like penicillin, as far as you know? I don't think so. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 7 to 10. Good. So what's your problem? Well, recently I've been getting this pain here, just behind my eyes and in my forehead. I see. Have you felt sick or dizzy at all or vomited? No, not at all. Though the pain is pretty intense sometimes. And how's your health generally? Have you had any colds or flu recently? I had a cold a couple of weeks ago, but that's gone. It was only a sniffle, really. Good. Are you studying a lot? Are you getting enough sleep? Yes, I'm studying quite a lot. I've got some exams coming up in December, but I'm making sure to sleep plenty. What time do you go to bed? They're usually around 11. I sleep about eight and a half hours, and I'm up about 7.30, so I have time to go jogging for half an hour before going to the university at nine. Very healthy. And has this pain kept you awake or stopped you jogging? Yes, it makes getting to sleep harder. It's much worse at the end of the day. I hardly notice it in the morning. What about food? Are you eating properly? I think so. My girlfriend cooks my meals. Right, and do you wear glasses? No. Aha, when did you last visit an optician? I don't remember. When I was a child, I suppose. OK. Well, I think first you should get that done again, just to make sure it's not the cause. In the meantime, take an aspirin or two when you're in pain, and come and see me again in a week. Ask the receptionist to give you an appointment with the optician. He's here on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. That is the end of Section 1. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear an announcement about arts events and activities. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 20. And now for some information about local events and activities. A couple of announcements for art lovers and budding artists alike. First, a new collection of artwork is going on show to the public next month in the form of an artist's exhibition. The exhibition will include many different types of art over a hundred different pieces by 58 artists from the local area. It's being held at the Royal Museum, which, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the area, is located opposite the library in West Street, right on the corner. The actual address is 1 Queen's Park Road. It isn't difficult to find. The exhibition will run for nine weeks and will begin on the 6th of October and continue until the 10th of December so there's plenty of time for you to go along and have a look. I'm sure that it will be well worth doing. What will you see there? Well, among the items on display will be some exciting pieces of modern jewellery, furniture, ceramics, metalwork and sculpture. To give you some examples, local artist Kate Main will be there to discuss her collection of pots and bowls that she has made to resemble garden vegetables. They are the sort of things that would brighten up any dining table and range from things like yellow cabbage-shaped bowls to round tomato-shaped teapots. Prize winner Cynthia Corse will also be there to talk about her silver jewellery, all of which she produced using ideas from the rural setting of her country home. Some of her rings are quite extraordinary and have beautiful coloured stones on them. Or, if you prefer sculpture, there's plenty of that too. Take, for example, Susan Cupp's white paper sculpture of 25 pairs of shoes. It sounds easy, but believe me, it looks incredible. All of these items, along with many others, will be on sale throughout the exhibition period. As part of the exhibition, there will be a series of demonstrations called Face to Face, which will take place every Sunday afternoon during the exhibition and these will provide an opportunity for you to meet the artists. The second set of activities are for those who would prefer to indulge in some artwork themselves. The Artists' Conservatory are holding a series of course over the autumn period. The courses cover all media and include subjects such as Chinese brush painting, pencil drawing and silk painting. All the tutors are experienced artists course sizes are kept to a maximum of 15 and there will be plenty of individual assistance. All the sessions offer excellent value for money and the opportunity to relax in a delightful rural setting. Fees are very reasonable 
and include the use of an excellent studio and access to the art shop, which you will find sells everything from paper to CDs, and they also include the provision of all materials. For more information on dates, costs and availability, you should get in touch with the programme coordinator on 0459 283 9584 or go direct to the website. That is the end of section 2. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear three students talking about the last tutorial. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Hi Sarah. That was actually quite exciting, wasn't it? You really think so, Dave? I'm completely worn out. If I have to take in another piece of information, my head's going to explode. It was good, though. I have to admit it was. Mm. And it was challenging. Challenging? The last tutorial? It makes me think I learned absolutely nothing at school. I understood nearly all of it, but a few bits. I'm not sure I got at all. Reading is reading, and that's that. Well, it is and it isn't, you know. We all read in the same way. No, we don't. What are you two arguing about? Oh, it's Terry. Hi. Reading. Reading? Yes, reading. That's not exactly a sexy subject to be arguing about, is it, Dave? I don't know. I find it quite exciting, really. <laughs> you would. We've just been to this tutorial on study skills as part of the English literature course, and Sarah's found it difficult to follow. No, Dave, that's not true. It's just there were some things that I'm not so sure about, or, more importantly, sure whether they're important or not. Well, what was the problem? Well, when I read, I just read, and Dr. Pratt was going on about all these different techniques that we need to develop and hone. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 27. Hmm, how do you read then, Sarah? I just read as I said, like everyone else. I read each word as it comes. How many pages do you read in an hour? About 25 to 30. And what about you, Dave? 60, maybe 70. 60 to 70? That's not a lot. How many do you read then, Terry? It depends. Uh, about 120. What? what? Oh, come on, Terry. Yeah, and I'm not unusual. One of my friends doing medieval European history, Arnold, he reads about 160 an hour. But does he remember it all? Yeah, I think so, Dave. I get through only one book a week. Me too. What about you, Terry? At the moment, three. And your friend Arnold? Twenty. Twenty? 
Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 28 to 30. In fact, what matters is that you develop your reading speed to suit the circumstances. You could still stick to your reading speed of 25 pages an hour for leisure purposes, but double your reading speed for reading journals or academic texts. If I'm scanning a text for specific information, I can just whiz through. Then when I find what I want, I'll read through the particular part very slowly. Hmm. With 40 to 50 or more books to get through in a term, you can't afford to read every word. Have you always read like that? No, it's only since I've been here. I find this all very depressing. How did you do it then? In the first week of term, in the first year, we had a tutorial on reading. From Dr. Pratt. Yeah, and I felt so inadequate after the class. Well, what did he tell you? He just gave us a few basic strategies on reading, and then over the last two years he's been nurturing us, so that we all now work very efficiently. So he's your tutor too. You can tell us then what he means when he talks about learning to read the content words only. Well, this is obviously just the first step. If you read every a, the, to, from, was, etc., it really slows you down. Yeah. But if you train your eye to look at the nouns, verbs, adverbs and adjectives... Assuming you know what they are... Well, then the big words. Then you automatically increase your speed. Yeah, that makes sense. Mmm, right. I think I'm going off to the library to start. Thanks for the tutorial. Any time. I'm off to the sports centre. By the way, what was your reading speed per hour when you first came here? Twenty-five? That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecture about coastal environmental problems. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we have with us Mr. Kevin Ackroyd, a representative from the Department of Environment, to outline the results of last year's inquiry into environmental problems along the coastline. Mr. Ackroyd, please. Thank you, Ms. Cranston. Good afternoon, everyone. Perhaps it would be best if I first outline for you what I plan to talk about. I'll begin with some background to the inquiry looking at the new demands we are making on our old resources, so to speak, and go on to give some idea of the conclusions we came to in our inquiry. Okay, first the background. 
The inquiry was sparked off because various concerned residents in the coastal region realized that the recent population shift, which really got going in the 1970s, was putting extreme pressure on our coastal environment. Over the past two decades, half of the country's population growth has been in the non-metropolitan areas. Today, nine out of ten people live in the coastal zone. The reasons for this shift are not yet fully understood, but there is a range of factors which probably contribute, including economic development, an aging population, and a growth in industry, particularly tourism and its associated industries. We would have to admit that government policies have also contributed to this trend, a trend which is likely to continue. So that it's estimated by the year 2005, there will be millions of additional people living in the non-metropolitan coastal zone. This population expansion puts considerable pressure on the natural resources of the zone, and there are two factors likely to impose particular strains. These are, firstly, that those areas of greatest growth in the past are likely to continue to grow as strongly as before. In other words, urban sprawl or expansion will continue for at least another decade. The second factor contributing to the pressure is industry, particularly the newer industries like tourism. These newer industries will compete for resources with other users, such as the intensive fish and shellfish farming industry. All of this will take place in an environment that is already under severe stress, and in particular, the water resources will be degraded. It is the view of the inquiry that water degradation, whether of seas, rivers, or lakes, is the greatest resource problem in the coastal zone as a whole. Now, the conclusion of the inquiry can be stated quite plainly and simply. First, we must raise the profile of the coastal zone in our thinking, especially in our approach to conservation and economic development. Second, we must exercise much greater vision. We must be prepared to think in the long term rather than the short term, and to pay attention to details. So better management and better planning. And thirdly, we must adopt a national approach. We can no longer afford to leave the decision making to individual departments, to local government bodies, or even to the central government. We are looking here at the need for coordination on a nationwide level. To achieve workable, effective results involving all levels of government, as well as the various non-government organizations in this country, will be no easy task. But it is imperative we try. Well, I see time is running out, so perhaps if I just summarize the recommendations made by the inquiry for you, the long view prevails over the short. Broad considerations predominate over narrow. The techniques of modern management and the tools of modern economic are brought into operation. People being affected by decisions, including indigenous people, are adequately consulted before decisions are made. With that, I'll stop and give the opportunity to ask questions. But perhaps first, I should tell you that the full report of the inquiry. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of listening test, the IELTS test. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.
Thank you.